Good morning, everyone. I'm very grateful to the AUCN for the chance to speak on this panel with really distinguished speakers, and I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there with you in person. My name is Olivier Lazard. I'm a researcher, policy influencer, and a planetary security analyst. I've spent the lion's share of my career in conflict zones over the last decade. And already then, a decade ago, I saw how vital, urgent the energy transition was in response to the climate collapse. If it was already clear to me in the last decade, it is even more so today. We've already, already crossed the 1.5 degree threshold compared to pre-industrial levels for all intents and purposes. Our world is on an exponential trajectory of catastrophe and geostrategic transformations that none of us really fully comprehend. Needless to say, the energy transition is one of the fundamental keys to a climate safe future. But here is the thing, the transition itself raises its own risks. One of them is about the mining and the processing of different minerals and metals needed to build a global clean tech infrastructure. And this is what I'd like to talk to you about today with a little presentation that will sort of give a sense of the stakes essentially that we're about to face as a human collective. In order to build the clean tech infrastructure at a global level, we need to decouple our energy system from fossils and to recouple it with mineral resources. That means essentially that we will have to rely over the decades to come over a number of different supply chains ranging from lithium to cobalt, rare earths, copper, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, all the various minerals essentially that help us to build solar panels, wind turbines, batteries and electrical grids. And we know that obviously electrical sort of you know clean tech infrastructure requires a lot more minerals and metals and materials in general and a lot more space than the um sort of fossil energy um era this is what the uh the the graph on the left hand sa side shows and the right hand side shows a number of different minerals and metals that we will be needing over the next decades in order to build our sort of climate safe future but obviously the important question to ask is where exactly mines that we will extract metals and minerals from will be located. And this is particularly where we can try and picture essentially the future stakes of security from a planetary and international perspective. Because as it so happens, the most interesting deposits for metals and minerals that I just mentioned are very often located in countries of the global south. Over the last decades, we've exploited a lot of different resources in the likes of the US, Canada, Australia, Russia, China. Those will remain really important countries in the future. But when we look at the number of mines that we need to create, the clean tech infrastructure, if we only listen to the likes of benchmark minerals, for example, we need to build about 386 mines over the next decade in order to, to meet the demand for battery related minerals, we will see essentially that there is a concentration of um, deposits and reserves in the likes of Latin American countries, Chile, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, in African countries. For the moment, we're mostly talking about Southern African countries, but there are lots of geological researches happening in the Central African region and beyond. We also see a lot of interest going in regions such as Central Asia, the Western Balkans, um, Southeast Asia, particularly for certain resources like nickel. You know, the, we, we've heard a lot and we will keep on hearing a lot in the next decades about Indonesia's role, particularly. And we will be also, also talking about other places, particularly in the deep seas. What this map shows, which is a map that the International um, Institute for Sustainable Development developed in 2018, it overlays essentially the various reserves that we are aware of and which are you know, constantly updated. These are the green dots overlaid on indexes showing fragility and corruption in fragile or conflict affected countries. What you will see is a fairly neat overlay essentially between the geological reserves that we need in order to build the global clean tech infrastructure and fragile and conflict affected spaces. What that means is something quite particular because as a conflict resolution practitioner, I have observed essentially that um, 
predatory behaviors are quite central to the notion of fragility, multidimensional fragility. When there are very important industries, particularly energy related and extraction related industries that abound essentially in fragile countries, the economic gains tend to be poorly equally distributed, whilst the costs from an environmental and social perspective tend to be you know, quite widespread and diffuse. This is one of the key stakes that we will have to face essentially in the race towards a climate safe future. This is even more important because a lot of the countries that are shown to be red and brown in the background are also, if you look at the map at the bottom of this slide, the most climate vulnerable countries. And this is particularly important because the IPCC tells us essentially that where there is already fragility today, where there is already issues of inequality, of misgovernance, of bad governance, then we have essentially a potential vicious cycle in the making when climate crises hit those countries, because a lot of the burden and the impacts will be borne by communities that tend to, you know, be quite, um, that don't tend to have a lot of safety nets available to them, and where they have to cope essentially with a lot of negative coping mechanisms in order to face the impacts of this climate crisis. And we see a lot of these risks, particularly concentrated in the African continent and in the Southeast Asian region um, of the world. So the more essentially we um, you know, wait to address climate justice, the more there is a potential essentially for different types of fragility to feed into each other. And at the same time, the reality is also that mining is extremely resource intensive depending on the technologies invested into the mine, particularly water intensive. And in some circumstances, mining will happen exactly where certain countries, certain communities encounter water stress and encounter certain types of disasters. So we will also have to be careful about the way in which mining practices are applied so as to make sure that they are ecology sensitive, climate sensitive, and obviously sort of oriented towards social governance, so as to make sure that they do not accelerate climate disruptions or resource extraction in a way that actually create more and more water contraction or contraction of ecological services locally as well as nationally. This gives you already a sense of the risk ladders essentially that we are you know, facing in this energy transition. There is yet another level which essentially connects the very local dimensions of a mine with more global dimensions of insecurity from a planetary perspective. What this next slide mm -hmm. shows, this is a slide extracted from um, research done by the Strasbourg et al team in Brazil, um, mapping out the global regeneration priority areas. This is a map that dates back to 2020. All of the areas shown in red, orange and yellow show you where we need to double, tr triple, quadruple down in terms of efforts regarding how to protect ecosystems, how to regenerate them, and so as to reboot essentially ecological services, not just for local benefits or national benefits, but for planetary benefits, particularly when it comes to carbon sequestration, as well as hydrological cycling. What you will see is that essentially this belt of countries between Latin American countries, African countries and Southeast Asian countries are priority areas for global regeneration, as well as being super endowed in mineral resources that are needed for industrial responses to the climate crisis. It creates essentially a fundamental tension between the nature-based responses to, to the climate crisis and the industry based responses. What this map demonstrates is that essentially we have reached a moment of our industrial and technological progress history, which risks pushing nature to the very boundaries, the very last boundaries of resilience, which we actually cannot afford. If we were to lose nature-based resilience within critical ecosystems, 
that helped to regulate the global climate regime, as well as planetary ecological interdependencies and ecological services, we would actually compromise fundamental planetary stability that help essentially to sustain complex human civilizations, as well as international security and human security. Extraction in the coming decades necessary for the clean tech transition will have to go hand in hand with regeneration from the micro scale to the macro scale. We have to protect nature in order to actually get over the hump of the extractive intensity of this energy transition. Without it, we will run into problems of fundamental water stress that will affect every single aspect of human security and international security, um, you know, um, henceforth. The other thing that we're going to need is essentially a sense of how to establish safe mine zones, places where we can mine with the best possible practices, and we will have to determine where it is actually not safe to mine. This will have to be determined on the level of criticality of, eco of ecological services, as well as brittleness of ecological you know, services in different regions. Again, this is the type of work that I'm trying to do at the moment with the University of Exeter, and we will welcome any type of collaboration going forward with any actor in the methodological and research space, as well as the legal space to essentially sort of look at how to establish no-go mining zones or no anthropogenic zones that will have to escalate towards a multi multilateral governance systems that helps us to essentially turn critical raw materials into a global public good necessary to accelerate the climate transition without compromising the natural capital of this world. In a sense, what we need is essentially an energy transition that does not plunder the planet and that respects key areas of planetary security and enshrines this into law and into international negotiations. And obviously what will be necessary and what will be the work of decades ahead of us is to essentially reimagine peace and security architectures on the back of the energy transition. We've learned this from history. Any type of energy or industrial revolution always takes place with fundamental shifts and transformations within power systems, within geopolitical systems, and therefore within normative and value systems. What we're facing today is a transformation of the relationship between different regions across the world, not just on the basis of power, but also on the basis of geography which will change everything. And that will be the conversation that a number of different, um, you know, sort of panels during this COP, but also more largely mechanisms going forward will have to engage with, rather than just engaging essentially with the economic and competitivity conversation of industrial policies going forward, which essentially risk fragmenting both international security as well as planetary security. Thank you so much.